I want to thank Adam and worship team. Did, did you guys catch the words to that song? I, I, um, I was sitting reading them last night. We, those are incredibly powerful lyrics. And I hope that you're able to listen and just picture the work and the forgiveness of Christ in a, maybe a fresh way. Well, good morning again, everybody. I'm really excited for today's message because today we're going to talk about God's forgiveness and how realizing what God's forgiven you and appreciating what Jesus did for you, it can, it can become sort of like a superpower for finding rest and security in this restless life. We've been talking about rest a bunch this summer in part because my sense is that right now in this season, a lot of us are exhausted, right? It has been a lot. There's been, you know, in our own church community, there's been a lot of real hardship. A lot of folks are under stress, a lot of adjustment, a lot of just trying to solve new problems with a lot of uncertainty. Now it seems like there's a lot of activity and catching up. So this summer, please take advantage of the time that you have. You have a wonderful opportunity to reset to get your head back on straight, to start looking toward future good things, and start beginning to reprioritizing time and effort, uh, reevaluate what's important, what's not. And as a church, I just want you and us to be set up well for the fall. Even on our schedule, we don't have a ton on our church schedule this month, but we're really hoping that you know, by the fall we can start some more programs. In fact, I'll just throw it out there. If you have some ideas about Bible studies or gatherings or really anything we can do to be together and help people, like now's the time to start praying and daydreaming. And I mean, just ask God, how can we use our gifts to love our neighbors? In fact, I'll just say this from a counsel standpoint. If you have a suggestion or a plan, we want to help you do what God's called you to do. So please reach out to me or one of our other council members. We really want to do whatever we can to help uh, us be set up for, well, for the fall. Now, part of resting and resetting, like it, it, it occurred to me that I think the hard part is always reevaluating what you say no to and what you say yes to and get some like, margin. Like Most of us need space to grow and to flourish, and it's hard when there's so many things to think about and so many things to say yes to. So we've been talking about for the last couple weeks about how God models rest. He works for six days and then he rests and becomes what Exodus calls refreshed. It's amazing. The problem with that, it sounds good, but it's hard because resting is different from relaxing. Let's just be real honest for a sec. Sometimes when you actually stop working, it's good. That's actually when your head starts spinning, right? And for a lot of us, it's our thoughts, not our work, that takes our rest away. There's voices in our head, there's images on our phone, and it's tough. Some of us are tormented by what I would call a sense of internal inadequacy. When you stop the rest, you can't help but asking, am I good enough? Am I faking it till I make it? You may know the term imposter syndrome. Like, what's going to happen when people find out that I'm sort of faking it because I'm deep down insecure. Like some of us can't rest because we're insecure about our failures or weaknesses, about our past or present. So you, you just, you can't rest because you keep thinking, am I a good enough dad or mom or daughter or son or employee or Christian? And some of us are exhausted because we can't stop questioning who we are. That's just ourselves. There's also relational inadequacy. You get restless because of conflict. And I know this from talking to you, and I'll be honest, I know this from myself. Sometimes you can't rest because your head can't stop doing the play-by-play -play of your day. You know what that is? Like when you replay all the arguments you could have won, or you plan the ones in the future when you're a more convincing version of yourself. I'm not the only one that does this, right? Okay, some nods, or you replay the hurtful things said to you. And planning retaliation is not restful. Or sometimes you realize, and I forget other people, you realize you messed up, and that's messed up relationships. This form of restlessness, by the way, this isn't just a Bible thing, this is a health thing. It's dangerous because it may look like anger or stress 
or a sense of inadequacy or fear. Like, like these are actually medically dangerous because they mess up your physical health. I mean, I'm not exaggerating here. People literally end up in the hospital because of stress, because they can't rest. Now, today, I, I want to give you a simple concept that we don't think about enough. It's a simple concept that can give you rest from all of that. It's a concept that can help you all become more spiritually and physically healthy. It can give you a sense of stability and an identity that you can build your life on to get yourself strong enough to help other people. Everybody ready to hear this? Okay, here it is. It's so simple, but you forget it. Christian, you are totally forgiven. You are totally forgiven. It just doesn't seem that way all the time. In fact, most of us don't really appreciate what the Bible says about this. The, the empty cross behind me is a symbol of the high price that Jesus paid, not for nothing, but for your forgiveness. And we must not forget that. In fact, if you could appreciate this, you would be better off and you would learn how to rest because Jesus says it is finished. In fact, to, under, to appreciate how wonderful it is now, you almost have to start by understanding how bad it was before the cross. We learn this in the book of Hebrews, which talks about what forgiveness looked like before the shed blood of Christ. I'm going to read Hebrews 9, starting in verse 19. Just, just picture this, right? Hebrews writes, When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, so the law of God, we read part of it. After Moses did this, he took the blood of the calves, blood, with water and wool and branches of hyssop, and he sprinkled the scroll and all the people with all that. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep in the same way he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything and the ceremonies, in fact, the law requires, Hebrews says, that everything be cleansed with blood and without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Did you catch that image? Before Christ in the Old Testament, in the pursuit of forgiveness and the security and identity that comes with that, people would come to worship services and part of the worship service involved slaughtering an animal and it seems very literally spraying people with blood. Can you imagine that? And somehow all of that was worth it because for that brief period of time, people were able to rest and flourish and feel free from all the stress and performance anxiety and the fear of being found out that comes from not being forgiven. Now, we're not spraying anybody with anything today, but uh, I just want you to appreciate what Hebrews is saying. That's what people were willing to do to experience forgiveness. And as Hebrews points out, they had to do it over and over again. But it was worth it because being, forgiven, be, being forgiven gives you rest and security. Like when you're forgiven, you have freedom from internal and relational inadequacy and guilt. And the headline of Hebrews 9 is that God's people at one time made frequent sacrifices in order to get forgiveness, but Jesus did something better. So verse 28 of Hebrews 9 says, Jesus was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And if you read Hebrews, it sets up this contrast with what Jesus did once versus the constant, unending uh, sacrifices of the Old Testament. Hebrews 7, verse 27, puts it this way. Unlike the other high priests, Jesus does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Jesus sacrificed for their sins once for all, when he offered himself. See what it says? One sacrifice 
for all sins. You know what that means? It means you're forgiven. <laughs> not one day at a time, not one worship service after the next, not one sin at a time, but you're, you're forgiven once and for all. As a Christian, you are totally forgiven. But we have a hard time with that. It gets complicated. In fact, Satan, do you know what his name is? The accuser of the brothers and sisters. So we continue to battle our own feelings of guilt and inadequacy. Am I doing enough? Can God still use me even though I, I've done this? And this is, like, this is a big deal. The complete takeaway of sins is hard to picture. That's why John the Baptist gets so excited in the book of John. He just, he, he sees Jesus, he just sort of shouts, Jesus is the Lamb of God who, remember what he says next? Who, that's a big deal. That's why the writer of Hebrews is so thrilled that Jesus Christ was sacrificed once instead of constantly to take away sins. Guys, this is the gospel, that you are totally forgiven in Christ. We have this idea, it's not really in Scripture, but we don't think that we're really forgiven. We somehow think that in order to be forgiven, we have to keep on confessing and re repenting, and if we don't do that, we're not forgiven. Like, we should confess sins, you should repent from sins. That's how you respond to seeing God's love. But we somehow think, here's a lie, we think that if we don't say the words, Jesus, I'm so sorry for whatever, we don't get forgiven. Like, like as if... Forgiven, forgiveness is some sort of inventory game, and you've got to remember everything you did or think of blanket uh, confessions, and if you don't, God won't forgive you. Like, you ever think about that? Like, what if you forget to confess one, right? It's, it's sort of a, a silly game. God, God doesn't work like that. Like, imagine if it's true that you're only forgiven of the sins you repent from and overcome. Like, what if you die like, before that all gets sorted out? Like, that's that's incredibly stressful and fearful and not resting in the finished work of Christ. Because the Bible says it's not your memory, it's not your ability to say the right words that makes you forgiven. You know what makes you forgiven? The sacrifice of Jesus. And it is finished. You are totally forgiven. And I think, you know, I think we naturally like to pile up things to do in order to get right and clean with God over and over and over again. But the gospel is, is clear. It's good news about what Jesus did. Let me give you some verses. 1 John 2, 2. Jesus, he, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not only ours, but for the sins of the whole world. Some translations have the word propitiation sitting there which means the gift that satisfies completely. Here's the thing. If God is satisfied with the sacrifice of his son, which brings forgiveness, like, isn't it a little bit silly to argue with God there? Like, sorry, God, you can't possibly forgive me. Do you know what I did? Uh, he does, and he does. And some of us are still restless and stressed and anxious like there are folks who have trouble sleeping at night because we don't think we're doing enough. We feel a sense of guilt that we shouldn't have. And Jesus says, well, in the words of the hymn, Jesus paid it all. Why do you keep beating yourself up? Because God says you're forgiven. Now this is why when you read in forgive, about forgiveness in the New Testament, most of the time you find forgiveness being used, expressed in the past Tense. You hardly find anything that says, one day God will forgive you. It's God did forgive you. For example, in Ephesians, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. So there, there are definitely things you ought to do um, just because, like here's why we don't talk about forgiveness a lot, because we think that uh, if we really believe we're forgiven, we won't bother to behave. But uh, look, look at this here. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. That's the past. Or here's Colossians. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, here's what God already did. God made you alive with Christ. He 
forgave us all our sins. I'll keep reading. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. Like, all of our sins, all the things that still torture you sometimes, all the things that, you know, tell you you're not enough, Jesus took it away, nailing it to the cross. That's a big deal. Or First John, I'm writing to you, dear children. I love that. Because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Like this is God speaking as a dad, talking to you, his kids. You're forgiven. Don't beat yourself up. Don't let other people beat yourself up. Don't allow yourself to get wrapped up, enslaved, or consumed in remembering things that God has chosen to forget. Instead, rest. Rest in the freedom that comes from being forgiven. Here's how our theological tradition puts it. This is a Heidelberg Catechism Q&A 56. What do you believe concerning the forgiveness of sins? Here's what we believe. I believe that God, because of Christ's satisfaction, will no longer remember any of my sins or my sinful nature that I need to struggle against all my life. Rather, by grace, God grants me the righteousness of Christ to free me forever from judgment. Like it's worth looking up all the scripture references. You have a handout with footnotes. Uh, it, I'm convinced that if this sinks in, this can change your life. You might be restless. You may be anxious remembering your sins. Why did I do that? Why didn't I do that? I am not good enough. I'm not doing enough as a dad or a mom. I'm not the son or daughter that I should be. I, I struck out here. I missed that. But God gives you the righteousness of Christ to free you forever from judgment. That's a big deal. It means you can be free. It means you can rest in God's goodness. It means you can close your eyes at night and instead of being tormented by feeling that you'll never be good enough, you can rest because you have the righteousness of Christ. A couple other things. This should probably change how you treat other people, right? Jesus tells a bunch of stories about this. It means that instead of being wrapped up and consumed by being passive aggressive or petty arguments or holding grudges like, or, or just being competitive with other people instead of trying to make yourself feel better by beating down on other people, you, you should just feel, well, it's, you know, it's weird. I think sometimes you feel better when you tell yourself that other people are the worst. It's a good time. Uh, you could forgive them because God forgives you. Jesus tells lots of stories about this. Another topic, what are we doing when we sin? I should talk about this because uh, a lot of pastors don't talk a lot about forgiveness because we think if we're forgiven, we're uh, going to keep on sinning. So what do you do when you sin? You should, we should stop and you should repent. Ephesians says anyone, this is fascinating, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. See what it doesn't say? It doesn't say anyone who's been stealing must confess their sin and ask for forgiveness. And then it really doesn't matter what they do next because God forgives you. It doesn't say that. Like some people are exhausted because they feel bad about stealing or whatever your preferred sin is. And they ask forgiveness, they feel forgiven, and they go back to doing it the next day. And they get themselves in a horrible cycle feeling bad at themselves. But what if instead of just feeling bad... What if, we, uh, what if we acted better? Like, you would be way better off. What if uh, relationships broken over sin? This is so common. Actually, look, look at Romans. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If possible, as far as it depends on you, that peace 
with everyone, which is to say, like, seek repair with those who you've hurt. Sometimes it doesn't work. There are things that you, you, there, there are things you can't patch up, but rest from revenge. Rest from those fantasies about telling the other person off or having them go through something terrible. Rest in Christ. Have that peace and comfort, and so you could love your neighbors. It's like this is really hard. I'll be honest, but this is the simple message of the gospel. In fact, it's put really well in another one of our theological statements. This is Belgic Confession, uh, I think Article 21. And I just love how it tells the story of Christ. So Jesus paid back what he had not stolen. And he suffered the righteous for the unrighteous in both his body and his soul in such a way that when he sensed the horrible punishment Required by our sins, his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. He cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's Christ. And Christ endured all of this for the forgiveness of our sins. Therefore, the confession says, we rightly say with Paul that we know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. We regard everything as loss because of, the, because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ our Lord. We find all comforts in his wounds, and we have no need to seek or invent any other means to reconcile ourselves with God than this one and only sacrifice once made which renders believers perfect forever. I'm just going to say that again. This is, like, it just made me think. That last line, we find all comforts in his wounds. We have no need to, look at this, seek or invent any other means to reconcile ourselves with God than this one and only sacrifice once made, this last line, which renders believers perfect perfect forever. You know, let's, again, just be honest with yourself for a minute. Some of us are uncomfortable. Some of us are rest less because in the language of the confession, we spend a lot of energy inventing and seeking ways to be close to God. We try and find other ways to find peace, purpose, and meaning when we can find it given to us in the sacrifice of Christ, again, to quote the, the confession, which renders believers perfect forever. But what if we somehow could? What if we could somehow find all comfort in his wounds? I, I think if you could do that, if the gospel really sunk in, I think you would be able to rest, to realize that you're forgiven, you would stand on firmer, more secure ground to love God, to pursue justice, and love your neighbors the way you should. You would be able to rest if you really believed that you were forgiven. So Father in heaven, could you remind us of words that the tempter denies? that we are forgiven in Christ. And Father, can you help us to rest from all of our insecurity, for all the times when we think that the bad things that happen to us are because of our guilt, that God doesn't love us, that God forgets about us. Father, can you remind us of the truth, that God loves us, he's forgiven us, he sees us as his own beloved son. And Father, could you help us to find precious, life-giving rest. Rest from our fears, from our worries, from our stress and anxiety. Can you remind us in fresh ways that we are forgiven and loved? And can you give us the rest that comes with that? Yes, all this in the name of your, your dearly beloved son. 
Jesus. Amen.